procedures in place and our very own procedures were not followed. That embarrassed admission from the state corrections chief followed the release of a still allegedly violent rapist. Now back in custody, he could be held indefinitely, could join the more than 200 sex offenders who've been civilly committed. State policy on sex crimes beyond Reagan's law on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. The so-called sexual predator. The state has stepped up its efforts to keep him in check, and Megan's Law is just the beginning. I'm Raymond Brown, and on the docket this week, the ongoing clash between the effort to protect and the right to due process. It's an issue that raises strong feelings on all sides, as we'll see when a county prosecutor and criminal defense attorney square off. We'll talk to a psychologist who's an expert on sex offenders and the risks they pose. But first... Here's Sandy King to bring us up to date on the latest twist in an ongoing dispute. Raymond Megan's law has drawn most of the headlines in the last five years, but it is just one piece of a state policy that treats sex offenders as a special class of violent criminal. From the way they're sentenced to where they're jailed to when they get out and what happens to them, the sex criminal may encounter a distinctly different set of rules. Rules that were squarely in the spotlight in recent weeks, thanks to a case which raised its own furor. And I can represent on the record that the Attorney General's office will make a determination as to whether or not they will seek civil commitment pursuant to Megan's law uh, to determine whether or not Mr. Alves is a sexual predator under that law and not civilly committable. The troubling case of Raymond Alves. It began with two brutal rapes in Bergen County back in the 70s, but it hit the front pages just last month when Alves was released in what state corrections called its own grave mistake. We did something wrong. We had procedures in place, and our very own procedures were not followed. He was back in custody within two weeks, following a bizarre 17-city bus trip that crisscrossed the country before his capture back here in New Jersey. Uh, it's my understanding that he thought his, uh, a ride was there for him. Uh, it turned out there was a ride for him, but it wasn't the one he might have expected. And he could remain in custody indefinitely under the state's tough new law that allows for civil commitment post-release for sexually violent predators. It's only one of the legal policy questions that continues to be a cause of pride in some circles, concern in others. We asked a former county prosecutor and a criminal defense lawyer to define just a few of those issues from their divergent points of view. They get back into the community. These same compulsions uh, affect them, and uh, they're going to commit their offenses again. Under normal civil commitment to, say, Greystone, you're reviewed by the courts every 90 days um, under the Sexually Violent uh, Predator Act you're reviewed by the courts every year. So the intent is to keep somebody locked up for as long as they possibly can. There was a really uh, widespread survey done uh, in Canada where it showed that the recidivism rate is 70% with, with pedophile sex offenders. Pedophile is one form of compulsion, if you will. Uh, the, same th the same way drug addiction is a, is, is a form of compulsion. Um, and if you're talking, should they be treated the same in prison? I think the answer is yes. We cannot allow that type of behavior. Uh, we have to punish that behavior. We also have to rehabilitate sex offenders. But the biggest problem we have is that what do we do with them after they've done their time? Should they have a special law that keeps pedophiles locked up after they fi they're finished their term of imprisonment? Um, no, I don't think so. 
Though the state's newest move to put Megan's Law info on the Internet is just one piece of the ongoing dispute over how to handle sex offenders and why they should be dealt with so differently from other violent criminals. And Sandy, that's the question that will be on the table when we come back. There could be fireworks ahead, so stay with us. think that they should even be let out. You know how they say history repeats itself? They usually do repeat it again. On the one hand, I believe you serve your time, you're done. But on the other hand, the rate of re recidivism is, is very high. Megan's law should apply to them, but I don't think they have to serve any more time than that. That's enough. They should maybe get some extra therapy or be given some kind of chemicals that they won't feel like doing that again. But serving their time should be enough, yeah. They did their time, that's it. If they have it up here in their mind to do, they do good to protect themselves and learn from their mistakes, you know, anybody can change. But we have to look at the other side also and look at the victim's side and see, am I going to be terrified for the rest of my life? It is just that question that has prompted not just community notification under Megan's law, but an overall state policy that says sex offenders should be treated differently than other violent criminals. Is that constitutional? Is it fair? Is it good public policy? Well, we're sure to get some different answers from Morris County Prosecutor John Daniel, who's also head of the State Prosecutors Association, from criminal defense attorney Brian Neary, and in York, forensic psychologist Philip Wood. Welcome to all of you. Dr. Wood, I'd like to start with you because it seems to me that much of the thinking in the legislature and even the courts as it relates to Megan's law and other aspects of how we treat sexual offenders is the premise that we know which offenders are likely to offend again. We can predict it and maybe even do something about it. Is there a scientific support for that belief? There is some. We, we know that there are two main factors that are associated with sex offender risk. And it's not rocket science. It, sex offenders are at higher levels of sexual deviancy on the one hand. They're more risk to reoffend. And sex offenders who are at higher levels of antisocial personality, psychopathy, as it's called, they're also at more risk to reoffend. Sex offenders who have high levels of both are in big trouble. Is it then a logical system that we have in which we categorize people and make judgments uh, about how we should treat people once they've been convicted and what we do with them after they get out? I think so. I think the state is using a standardized sex offender risk assessment scale. Uh, it's attempting to get some consistent judgments in, in using that scale. And it's a reasonable scale. We need some research to validate it better, but it's a, it's a decent scale. So you're satisfied with the political debate surrounding, for example, the Megan's Law and other aspects of sexual treatment makes sense even from a scientific point of view? Well, some of it. Uh, certainly, um, there's a fair amount of hysteria associated with it as well, but, but some of the debate is, is reasonable. Brian, what's your sense? Is there more hysteria or more reason than I said? Well, you know, you asked the question about the punishment, Ron. Um, it's not surprising because process also hurts with regard to, to sexual offenders. There is a hysteria, and the public debate, I think, is fueled by the fear. We will incarcerate, we'll keep people convicted of sexual offenses while they're in jail, and we'll want to keep them beyond there. Why? Because we're afraid of the potential of what they might do, and, the, and, and not knowing in, in the imprecision of science, not knowing how we can prevent them from doing further. The answer, keep them away as long as we can. But is there a way to handle this in a manner that's more consistent with what you regard as due process on the defense side? Well, there has to be some consideration that, as one of the, 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 the people on the street said, well, when they do their time, they do their time. We can't keep them away forever. We have to take out the hysteria in the debate and hope that policymakers, scientists, social scientists, and otherwise good-thinking people can find a way with which to turn these people around, to keep them uh, warehoused. Eventually, they're going to get out, and we wind up having the same problem again. John Daniel, since we seem to be going further and further in our willingness to identify people even after they've been convicted and done their time and um, have civil commitments to extend the time even beyond the criminal time, do you think there's any hysteria involved in this debate on the side that's saying let's go further and further? I'm sure there is. I think we've had a number of cases that have dramatized the Megan's case, for instance, uh, the, the fear that uh, these individuals are out there 
Um, the, the problem I have is that the risk is too great. That is, if, if uh, we are to uh, start releasing these people when they commit and complete their uh, sentence, uh, when the risk factors are there and the likelihood that they will reoccur, uh, recidivism will, will happen, uh, that really concerns us that uh, victims are children quite often, uh, or, or women, and I don't think from the prosecutor's standpoint we can afford to take that risk. Uh, we've come a long ways as I look at the research. We treated sex offenders in the 30s basically as mental patients uh, in hospitals, and things started to change in the 60s. And we've, we've learned a lot, as Dr. Wood said. We have a lot more to do, uh, a lot more studies, a lot more research. But uh, we, see, we do seem to treat sex offenders differently than any other kind of violent offenders. Do you think that's justified by the evidence, or are we wrong or in one category or the other? I think it's justified. Uh, they pose a special risk. Uh, quite often, uh, there's extremely high rates of recidivism among our sex offenders. Um, and and uh, I think that the studies that we have to date justify the special treatment that they receive. Let me ask you, how comfortable are you with the, the statement, which seems to be accepted widely in the political debate, that there's an extremely high rate of recidivism among sex offenders? I'm very comfortable. I, I have seen the results. I've seen many cases in my own office and other prosecutors' offices where these individuals would be sentenced, they would spend a period of time in prison, they would be released and they commit offenses again. Uh, there, there are actual clear-cut patterns strong enough there that we have to take special attention. Right? Yeah, I, I think, Ray, that, uh, that our concern, particularly when there's a crime against the child, and that really was what, what, what made the, the, the Catholic case so terrible, that this was a child. And we say, how do we answer that problem? How do we deal with it so that a mother and a father and a family doesn't do it again? But I, I think what, from a policy point of view, there's a need to break down the categories of those charged and convicted of sexual offenses and distinguish which people are those that, by necessity, we must isolate. And there are evil people, and there are people who need to be isolated. On the other hand, I think that there is probably a significant portion of, of offenders that the, the social science and the, the clinical population will tell us, doctors will tell us, who should be treated, who can be treated, and can, can be reintegrated into the community so that we're not at a risk and that women and children and those who may be predated pr to someone who otherwise is untreated uh, will not be at that risk. Dr. Rick, uh, Brian has made the suggestion that there are ways of treating sex offenders in the broad political debate. There's very little discussion about treatment, but in the scientific community, what do we know about treatment? Well, we, we know a couple of things. First of all, we know the treatment works, but it doesn't work perfectly. It can reduce recidivism by, say, 50 percent. Uh, that's far from perfect. And with some very high-risk individuals, it may not work at all. Uh, but we know with the run of the mill sex offender, if there is such a thing, that, uh, that it works reasonably well, as, about as well as most other mental health treatments. We have a separate facility at Avenelli, New Jersey, for sexual offenders. Yeah. Um, what's the rationale for having them all together? I mean, is it possible that it reinforces pathology to have them together, or is that something that's been looked at and has been decided that a joint facility like that is what makes sense? Most treatment programs around the country for, for high recidivism sex offenders like the Evan Elf people are, are separate facilities. Sex offenders tend not to get along too well in the general prison population. They're ostracized, abused. It's difficult to treat them when you mix them either with the general prison population or, on the other hand, with psychiatric uh, patients in a state hospital. In terms of the idea of recidivism, and I guess we should define it and be clear that we're talking about the, the tendency to repeat and to commit the same crime again, are all sex offenders subject to high rates of recidivism, or can you distinguish one from another? There are different subgroups. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the general thinking that all sex offenders have high rates of recidivism, because that simply isn't the case. Uh, the overall rate of recidivism, if you lump them all together, is typically in the 30s at most 30 percent in most studies that I've seen. And when you separate them into different categories, you can get even more refined. Incest offenders, for example. So let me stop you. If 30 percent is overall, so how does that compare with the general population of violent offenders? Is it higher or lower? Well, murderers uh, repeat at very low rates, so it's higher than murderers. Uh, but my understanding is that, that crimes against property and drug offenses are far higher in terms of recidivism. Now, within that 30 percent, you say there are some where there's a very low rate and others where it's higher? That's correct. For example, incest offenders. Incest offenders tend to have rates of recidivism that are less than 10 percent. And yet, by the way, many of them would be uh, classified as tier two and possibly put on the internet registry. Um, exhibitionists, fortunately, a nuisance offense, sometimes have recidivism rates of 70 percent. 
in individuals who molest young boys outside the family. Uh, recidivism rates in 40, 45 percent. Individuals who molest young girls outside the family have recidivism rates around 30 or 35 percent. Now, you mentioned earlier a 50 percent success rate with treatment. Does that apply with all of these categories, or are some categories more amenable to treatment that requires them not to? Pretty much all of them, with the exception that, that really high recidivism individuals, individuals who have high levels of sexual deviancy and high levels of, of antisocial personality, are very difficult for anyone to treat. Those are civil commitment cases. Now, that's the best, when you have the best level of treatment, those are the rates. Are we giving the best level of treatment possible at Avenal, the state facility? Actually, Avenal has a pretty good program. It's really quite similar. I know it's gotten some bad press recently, but it's really quite similar to sex offender treatment programs around the country. Now, Brian, when you hear Dr. Rick talk about levels that may be as low as 30%, and yet we hear people like our good friend John Fenn, you talk about 70% as a rate. Does it strike you that the kind of complexity that is suggested by talking to Dr. Rick gets factored into the political discussion and legal discussion? See, I think from a political point of view, we all accept the notion that we should have this, that there should be no recidivism. We want these people no longer to offend. The question is, what's the approach? We've taken the one approach is we have something called I don't know, a diagnostic treatment center. The reality is, you don't get treated there, and you do your maximum time there. So that we are getting ready to release people to the population who haven't been treated, who will very well be recidivists. John, were you thinking of that? Do you agree with that? I, yeah, well, I was thinking of we have situations, as, as we just talked about, with the Elvis uh, case. Which uh, Elvis, the young man who's so scared he can't come right, out. And, just and, uh, and those are the kinds of situations that we as prosecutors are very much concerned with. Uh, the studies have shown individuals like Mr. Elvis, uh, there's a high likelihood that they will go out and again commit another offense. And uh, again, they've maxed out, they've served their time, but uh, the danger is so great that we can't afford to put them back out of society. So the, the question I really think becomes, what percentage of those people are those who we no longer want to see back in society, that we will have to have civilly committed as these dangerous sexual offenders? If the response is simply, they all are recidivists, so we have to keep them all away forever, one will never treat, and secondly, we'll never let them out. Yeah, I guess that's the question. But as, as we hear the public discussion taking place, I don't hear a lot of distinctions being made between some categories that might be 30% or lower and a case like Al's where at least prosecutors argue he's a guy very likely to repeat. Um, how do we get to the point where we're, we're in the public conversation, in the legislature, there is a distinction between those different levels of recidivism? Well, I think I'd have to defer some of this, uh, your question to Dr. Rick. Uh, obviously, we can't, uh, we can't count everybody together. Everybody who is a sexual, sexual offender uh, is going to remain long after their prison sentence. I, I think we realize that that's not necessarily going to be the case. But there are those individuals that the, where the experts analyze all of the factors that find there's a high likelihood that they will be a predator again upon another young child or another woman, and uh, therefore we cannot allow them to be released. Let me go to Dr. Rick to the other extreme from what you say is good treatment at Avenel to the concept under, for example, Megan's law, which is likely to expand of having public notification and therefore the possible ostracism or social pressure on men, conceivably women who come out after these convictions. Does that make them less likely to repeat? Does it provide a protection that isn't balanced by the kind of pressure it's putting? The problem is that we simply don't have. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of intense emotion about community notification. We have absolutely no data on it. Uh, we really don't know whether states that have instituted it in various forms have lower rates of recidivism, lower rates of sex crimes after they institute these laws than they have before. There has been one study, to my knowledge, the state of Washington, uh, when they instituted the law, found that there was no change in sex offender uh, uh, sexual crime rates. That's the only study I know of, and that's not enough to really reach any conclusion. So the huge de debate about notification isn't premised on any real scientific work to this day? None whatsoever. Now, Brian, let me ask you a tough question. Uh, if, in fact, you want to take the position that the notification debate is not premised on a lot of evidence that's reliable, uh, there is a case in my court recently of a young woman who did receive notification and learned that a man who had molested her at age 16 is now going to be living a couple of blocks from her and indeed his house is in front of the bus. She has to take every day. Clearly a case where one would say something needs to be done. 
I think such an extraordinary set of circumstances that I hope doesn't become the example by which we, we evaluate community notification and treatment. So I'm afraid that one of the byproducts of notification, particularly if there's going to be a community view and cry that there is a sex offender in my treatment, uh, in, my, in my community, is that there will no longer be stability in, in that person's life. They will become vagrants. They will go from community from community to community. They may, ne may never be given the opportunity to receive any form of treatment, whether public or private, the stability will not be an element in their life. Well, I mean, we know already that you have a great concern about security. Let me ask you to look at the other side. Mm -hmm. Is there any concern that in an area where we don't really seem to have much scientific evidence, that the notification process has kind of become a political football without a real scientific basis for deciding how far it should go, and instead of looking at it in little steps to have scientific support, you're going really to the extent. Well, you, you, if, you're, if your question really asks, should we wait and, and put a stop on, on the direction we're going with expansion of Megan's and, and, and civil commitment proceedings that we're now looking to, to do, uh, I just don't think, I think the risk is far too great. We have enough studies to show uh, when people like Dr. Wood analyze an individual, uh, they have a pretty good feeling that there's a likelihood that they're going to go out and commit another offense. And uh, for us to say, let's, let's uh, put that aside and let's do some more research before we, we start this uh, process, uh, I can't afford to have another young child be a victim or another woman be a victim. I, I but isn't there a level of, it, I, guess, Brian, yeah, I was going to say, it, it's almost like we don't give the offender the chance to receive the treatment, albeit there will be a form of notification, but the notification is going to be premised on simply that you are an offender without being able to say, A, how much work I've done to to prepare myself, to help myself in this situation, or B, having a state facility. If you're in Avenel, you would hope to be treated, and the reality may be you weren't. So you were, you're, you're already a step back. Not only have you haven't been helped for that period of time, but you wind up now being put into the community and say, look, he still is a sex offender, and he didn't have the chance to correct that. Isn't there an intellectual dishonesty in the civil commitment process? That is, instead of saying we're going to have much better treatment and more consistent diagnosis, and then we're going to give people longer sentences if appropriate, we're going to give them sentences that are shorter, and then if there are certain people who seem ready to get out, we're going to move for a civil commitment. I mean, it does seem to me as if you're not really willing to look completely and thoroughly at the problem. Is that a compromise? I, I think uh, there is some compromise, and I think going back to comments Dr. Witt made a little bit earlier, that there is so much we still don't know. Um, we, we, we don't have a lot of research yet on, on the true effect of Megan's laws. It's been in place for more than 50 years now in New Jersey. Uh, I know one or two cases we've experienced in our county where we think it was helpful to apprehending a, a registered uh, offender. Um, but there's a lot of research yet to be done. We, as, as Brian does point out, a lot of these uh, registrants will move quite often. Uh, we'll no sooner get ready to provide the hearing process and they've moved to another county or, or actually even left the state. Uh, so th we are still operating without a lot of solid research that we would love to have. And, and think that will come about, but uh, again, as I said earlier, the the, uh, uh, the risks that we run to, to simply put everything aside and allow these folks to try to go back but, into society. But that is whether some of this is too exciting. If, if you drive a guy out of my care to Passaic or even across the river to Manhattan, in social terms, have, it seems to me you haven't accomplished anything. His risk is the risk. Mm -hmm. And either we're doing something to address that risk moving through, or we're simply allowing a process of what amounts to community ejection or exile. Uh, that simply moves them somewhere else. And it seems to me that doesn't sound like you're really wrestling with the problem. Well, again, it's, it, talking about, you're talking about are we allowing that individual to make, uh, take treatment, and what type of treatment would be appropriate? I don't know that we're not. I, I don't know that requiring somebody simply to be registered, and this is a, a notification procedure to the community, uh, is, is preventing them from getting treatment. Doctor, let me ask you then, finally, is it your view that there's any danger or risk involved in this process of notification, since we don't know in great detail what it's about, does your instinct tell you this may be risky? Well, I, I certainly think that for some offenders it is risky. It will, it will place some offenders under substantial stress, and all other things equal, that's a problem. It, it, could, um, it could cause them to deteriorate in their emotional state, and, and that's not good. And Brian Moody, what about the idea of moving folks out of their community because of hostile sentiment based on a prior conviction that the police will take back? Well, we've, we've been talking about the dialogue about public policy and how it, but the political reality is that no one wants to be the person blamed for having a terrible consequence of someone who's been released to the community. 
prosecutor doesn't want to get blamed because they didn't push the conviction as far. A prison official doesn't want to get blamed because they released the person's word. I'm going to get blamed if I don't stop this one. Brian will have to wrestle with this further. John Dangler, Dr. Nick, thank you. That's it for this edition of Due Process. But you'll want to join us next time. We will be taking on another cutting-edge issue of law and social justice. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Randy Ray. So believe that there is something called rehabilitation in the community or being a debt to society. One of the things, unfortunately, though, that we found with sexual predators, it's very, very difficult and highly, I won't say highly unlikely because I guess that's prejudicial, but it was seen to be that way when we heard that we have sexual offenders. There's a higher level of community concern that I believe is justified with sexual predators at this point in time. That's all we're looking at. I haven't looked at the other legislation and haven't really focused on it. to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and